Thanks for being here today for uh, another of our Living History Conversations to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy this November. As Sharon mentioned, one of my responsibilities at the museum is to manage our ongoing oral history project. This is a dynamic and growing initiative which has captured almost 1,100 recordings uh, of the life, death, and legacy of President Kennedy and the history and culture of the 1960s. Uh, if any of you have stories to share about where you were when President Kennedy was shot or memories of the 1960s and social activism of the time period, please get in touch with us via our website, jfk.org, and we'd be happy to add your voice to this tapestry of living history. From the Oral History Project, occasionally we have a voice that emerges, a, a remarkable storyteller who we like to invite back to the museum to share his or her story in front of, a, in front of an audience. And that's what living history is all about. And you're in for a real treat today. We have a, a true hero of the civil rights movement here to share his firsthand account of not just civil rights in Dallas, Texas, but in Atlanta, uh, Atlanta Georgia, and throughout the South. And we're gonna, we're gonna cover a lot of ground today. We're gonna talk about a number of different activities through a number of different years. And uh, I wanna introduce uh, our, our very special guest and a good friend of this museum, Ernest McMillan. Please join me in welcoming Ernest to share his story Thank today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, man. Absolutely. And uh, we have a few members of the Millen family here. Do you want to introduce your, your yeah, family? Yeah, I'm very happy to see my mother here, uh, Eva Catherine Partee McMillan, who is the uh, heart and soul of our family constellation, and one of my sisters, Karen uh, McMillan, and Jacqueline Hill, my other sister. So I have two sisters here, and others, others may be joining us lately. I want to just say something about my two sisters, though. When I was growing up, they gave me holy hell, but I'm <laughs> in a loving way. <laughs> Well, we're always glad to have the McMillan <laughs> clan here to, uh, to support the museum, and it, it's great that you could be here today. Now, Ernie, you're a Dallas native. At the time of the Kennedy assassination, you were attending Morehouse College in Atlanta. But I want our story today to begin in uh, the early part of the 60s. You were a student at uh, Booker T. Washington here in Dallas. We have your... Uh, 1963 uh, class graduation photo here to look at. Um, you got involved in civil rights pretty early with the NAACP Youth Council here in Dallas. You, uh, in particular, were involved in an early demonstration at the uh, Majestic Theater. Tell us about that. Yes, uh, I was a high school student at Booker T. Washington and a member of, of the NAACP Youth Council as well. And one of the activities we were engaged in, other than some of the normal <coughs> regular activities like formal teas and get-togethers was actually going downtown on Sunday afternoon to stand in front of the Majestic Theater, which is in downtown Dallas, and stand there in line, dressed up in our Sunday best, and uh, wait for uh, to be the next person in line to go before the admission counter and ask for a ticket. You could get a ticket to go to the basement or lower levels uh, I'm sorry, to the balcony of us, but to get to the main entrance to the matinee area, you had to buy a special ticket that was limited to whites only. We were politely told, no, you cannot get a ticket, and we would just nicely go back to the end of the line and wait till I get ourselves back up front again, and we would ask for a ticket again, and again we would be refused. This would go on for a couple of hours every Sunday that I can remember during the school year, and maybe during the summer too. It was a regular part of your routine to go regular, down there and do that. Yes, uh-huh. Uh, give us a sense, an, a, a general sense of segregated life in Dallas, separate drinking fountains, separate restrooms. What do you remember growing up in the community? Well, I grew in, up in a pretty intact community. It's now called uh, Uptown. Upper, Uptown. Uptown. It's a Thomas and Hall Street area, bordered by McKinney and now Central Expressway. Uh, that was a, my home for most of my life. I was born in that neighborhood. So venturing outside of it was not anything ever really expected or required because everything was pretty much there. Uh, we had movie theaters, uh, barbershop, grocery stores, libraries, schools, uh, the YMCA, the Bethlehem Center. Uh, everything was right there within a mile radius of our home. And so from elementary school to high school, I could pretty much walk to any one of those places. Uh, churches were there, the funeral homes. Uh, uh, it was a very vibrant community with a lot of life. And so I grew up feeling like this is it. This is the world. This is my world. And, but as you grow older, you begin to see that 
restrictions for your movement, for your growth, for your development become more and more apparent. But at that time, uh, the State Theater was right in our neighborhood, was right okay with me. I could just walk three blocks down the street and I would go to the State Theater. And, but if you were not allowed to go to the Majestic Theater or the Palace Theater downtown, uh, the buses were segregated. Blacks had to sit to the back of the bus. We had uh, the water fountains that you spoke of earlier, in which uh, you could go downtown and shop, but you couldn't try on any clothes. Uh, blacks were refused to, to be able to try on the clothing or the shoes. You were stuck with whatever you bought. And uh, the employment of, of African Americans at that time was pretty much limited to the service industry. So we had mostly uh, maids, waiters, porters, uh, butlers, drivers, uh, people of that sort for the journalist part of our community were in that occupation. Uh, but one of the good things is that the uh, school system had dedicated teachers and well-qualified teachers who were remained in our neighborhood from PhDs to fresh graduates in our schools. Booker T. In Washington was known for its uh, production of academics and I think our principal, Dr. Patton at that time, was the first person to start the black history, we call Negro history class mm -hmm. in the 30s. So he, we had that kind of tradition in our schools too. Uh, my family uh, was a unique family, by ordinary folks, but my mother came from a farming community out of Carrollton area and my dad came from an East Texas community, but his his family was a profession. His father was a doctor that started the first uh, hospital over on Thomas Avenue. And uh, he was specialized in obstetrics, obstetri obstetri <laughs> excuse my French. And uh, he used to travel and deliver babies by buggy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and my mother's family grew up in the Carrollton, White Rock area and moved to the inner city when my father got challenged by his age. In fact, there was also a restriction on owning your land, too. And people were stealing land from African-American farmers also at that time. So growing up in a family that had a, a wealth of energy and spirit, uh, my uncles were very active in education. And one uncle who was, a, who was the first executive secretary of the Progressive Voters League. So being involved in civic activities, my mother for example, worked for the polls and helped register people to become registered voters by having to pay their poll tax, reminding them of voting elections coming up. So we having a family that was uh, secure in itself in terms of knowledge and hope for the future and being active in the community was part of my heritage, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when it became apparent that uh, we were being stifled for our own growth, it was just a natural response to do something about it. And so, to me, at the age of four, 13 and 14 and 15, the NAACP activity was really timid and mild. And we wanted about, what are we get a little angry and get moving here? But uh, patience was the thing that was demanded of us and follow stride, and that's what we did. So you graduated Booker T. Washington in 1963. Yes. In fact, in this photograph, that's you on the uh, very far left, correct? Yeah, it might look like the war in 20s, <laughs> but it was actually 1963. That was our senior class day, and we were just showing off our theme of war in 20s. <laughs> and you, uh, you moved to Atlanta to go to Morehouse College, and that's where you were on November 22nd, 1963. Walk us through that day and, and tell us how you found out about the shooting here in Dallas. Okay, Morehouse College is located in the inner city of Atlanta, and it shared uh, campuses with Clark College, Spelman College, all joined it, so it's the center of the Atlanta University area. So it's pretty much an all African American community uh, of schools. But when Kennedy was killed, just to be known as a person from Dallas made, us, made me on an enemies list. And so uh, I was fortunate to have good roommates, one of those, roommates was from Birmingham, Alabama, who had been in uh, demonstrations in Birmingham that summer. And he was from Parker High School, which was one of the schools in the forefront of the struggle to liberate and integrate Birmingham. And so he warned me that people were out looking for people from Texas, as Dallas especially, and my 
I was becoming to be a attention of others. And so he it's recommended I stay inside, that I not go out and get my lunch, but he bring my food to me for several days, and uh, just to stay away. And people would actually knock on the door saying, where is he? Where is that in from Dallas? And so it was kind of a terrifying period. Uh, people were responding, just want to vent out their anger at that time. Now, what did, what did the death of the president mean to you? Kennedy had come out in support of the civil rights movement uh, with a televised address in June of 63, and then he, he shot and killed in November. What did this do to you and, and your thoughts as, as what would happen to the civil rights movement without, without President Kennedy's support? Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, you know, our, our family was pretty much involved in civic activities. So being a part of uh, having some naivety or knowledge about politics was something kind of expected of us to know about it. So we had some hope that with the election of uh, President Kennedy, there would be some changes. Uh, his promise of uh, equality and fairness and uh, open presence toward the world and uh, challenged us to that's not what our country can do for us. It was something that kind of struck me as well as, as something new. Because up until that time, you know, children to be seen and not heard. And but with the demonstrations in Birmingham and the murder of Mega Evers and even before that with injustices in Dallas, they had a bred sort of a climate of resistance from us and fear in some parts too. So with his death, it was kind of a, like a uh, it, hit, it hit us hard and the fact that it was shocking for something like this to happen in the first place to the President of the United States is that's something else as well but to be to John F. Kennedy who represents a special kind of hope in many part, persons heart including my own that was kind of devastating so it was, we were in a shock for a while it was a traumatic experience and I think it, it led to a whole chain of events that began to bring out a turning point in individual like my own mind and personality as well as others but as I said you know growing up in Dallas had its own challenges and in the 50s in Dallas we were a segregated city uh, it was a headquarters for a lot of arch right wing activities it was a headquarters for the John Birch Society if you were driving to Dallas you would see a big sign saying welcome to Dallas thanks to the John Birch Society which was a uh, organization fighting against things like fluoride of water. You know, the, to put fluoride in the water was considered a communist conspiracy. And so we've, there was petition drives against fluoride in the water. Uh, there was bitterness to be involved in the United Nations. Uh, in fact, I think before Kennedy was assassinated, Adlai Stevenson was in town a month before that, and he was ran out of town in a sense, you know, attacked verbally and spat upon because he was the spokesperson of the United Nations and on an institution they felt to be a uh, outlaw, a renegade. And, and you paid the price for that as a Dallas resident living outside the state because you were, you were victimized at Morehouse. Well, I don't, yeah, I think people kind of have a sense that Dallas was unique in a lot of ways, you know, uh, and so, but just the fact that being from Dallas in itself for an African American student may have been enough, mm -hmm. you know, because they know that another black person may not have been responsible for sure, but just the fact that in that hometown, somebody had to pay the price, mm -hmm. and I guess I was one of those. While you were at Morehouse, you became involved with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, better known as SNCC, and uh, you had to get your parents' permission to get involved with SNCC, and then you went to Freedom School. Tell us a little bit about the training you went through to become part of the SNCC organization. Okay. Uh, I think in those days, 21 was considered an adult, and I was like 18, and, and it was a dangerous uh, job I was to be considered hired for, which was a field secretary. A field secretary is considered a person who would go out into uh, predominantly black belt counties or in the deep south, in the hardcore south. And that, in those times, it was southwest Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and some parts of Louisiana, where SNCC was concentrated. And we were engaged in voter rights uh, education and re voter registration for the most part. And our theme was one man, one vote. And so, but it led to a lot of dangers, a lot of attacks. People would be attacked for just standing in line to vote. Uh, as I said, Mega Everett was killed in June of that year for leading the voter registration campaign in Mississippi. And so it was not just a legal requirement, it was a 
question of danger and, uh, and putting your life in jeopardy. But I was glad to have my father in Atlanta and my mother in Dallas who were uh, both supportive of me going. They said, both told me that if this is something I want to do, felt in my heart to do, then they would, they would support it. Mm -hmm. And that's been a theme all my life. You know, you feel like it's in your heart to do, they would support it. And so my father was attending a, a theological school in Atlanta, uh, Interdenominational Theological Seminary. And so he was right there. He could sign the papers for, for me. So I went from there to uh, Freedom School in a little town outside of Savannah, I think it's called Dor Dorchester School. And people like uh, uh, Andrew Young, uh, uh, other leaders of the civil rights movement would actually teach us on the constitutional rights. We would actually have exercises and uh, demonstration, role playing about demonstrations, how to handle yourself. We, we did analyzations of uh, the power structure and how the power structure worked and how, what points in the power structure should be attacked to make change and more vulnerable for change. And how to talk to people, how to go in and integrate yourself in the community. And we were, we were not high paid workers. We were paid like $9.64 a week. So we had no room for hotels and stuff. We stayed with the people in the community. My first assignment was to Albany, Georgia, and later, I'm sorry, to Albany, yeah, Albany, Georgia, and then to uh, a little town, a little county called Lee County, which was uh, just north of Albany, which had the highest uh, number of lynching for the state of Georgia at that time. I didn't know it at the time, but uh, I was assigned next to a young man by the name of Willie Ricks to be his rookie in training. And so it started from southwest Georgia uh, in those in early days, and then I eventually ended up working in Selma, Alabama. I got arrested there in the Delta counties of Mississippi, and uh, came back to Texas after a couple of years of that kind of work. You, you got to meet Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and I know it had a, a profound impact on you. Tell us about your, you saw him a couple of times, but you mm -hmm. had one personal encounter <laughs> with him. Tell us about that. Well, I was just, uh, he had a magnetic pull about him. In fact, to have him on your campus to speak, no word had been given by leaflet, flowers, a public announcement. It was just electricity went through the air saying, Dr. King is on campus. And so the first time I saw him, he spoke at a chapel, but you couldn't get inside, so I had to stand outside at the window. They raised the window so people could peek their heads in and hear him speak. So that was my first opportunity to, to I couldn't really see him very good because there's so many people, but I could hear his voice. And uh, the next time I was able to see him was maybe a couple of years later. I think it was maybe 65, and I was in Atlanta for some business with SNCC. And the executive secretary of SNCC asked me to deliver a package to him that needed, required his signature to be actually guaranteed receipt. So I got to the SCLC office, which was not too far from where our SNCC office was, maybe a half a mile or two miles. And so I went there and they told me to wait. He was on an international call. And then after waiting a while, he, still he was still on the international call, but he told me to go in. He beckoned me in. So I went in with the package in my hand. He was, uh, he had an open collar of his tie and he was barefoot with socks. And he had been kind of talking from the couch and his feet propped on the couch, he got up. And he walked over to me and he smiled and, he, and I gave him the package, he signed it. And he was still talking on the phone and listening and going back and forth. And I was able to get the, the document signed, the receipt delivered. And that was my first opportunity to actually see him that close. And uh, I always imagine a giant of a man, you know, taller than me, bigger than me. Maybe he had to stoop down to get in the building. But he, he, wasn't, he was not nearly that tall. And I have kind of looked eyeball to eyeball even with him. So I was amazed that a man was this small statue could be so powerful. <laughs> and that really rocked my world in to understand that. You, uh, you returned to the Dallas area in the, the mid-60s, and you enrolled at Arlington State College, which is now mm -hmm. uh, uh, University of Texas at Arlington. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they had a, uh, a theme <laughs> on campus. It was a Confederate theme, an Old South theme with the Confederate battle flag. How did this mesh with your ideals about civil rights and your activities with SNCC at that time, going to a, a campus that had a Confederate theme? 
Yeah, I was going from culture shock to cultural shock, you know, in a way. But uh, Arlington State College, as it was then called, was in Arlington. We had to commute there. All they had dormitories as well, but it was pretty much a commuter school. And so out of the maybe 8,000 students that were there, maybe 300 of us were of African-American descent. And so from Fort Worth, Grand Prairie, Dallas, we all kind of banded together. We kind of had to watch each other's back because we had a climate of hatred and, uh, and, and a kind of an arrogance and superiority from the, the faculty as well as the, the majority of students. They had even such thing called Old South Week in which uh, the women would dress up in their antebellum gowns and uh, the guys would dress, wear Confederate uniforms. They would have their little balls, uh, dances, and cotillions. And I guess they expected us to show up as servants or wearing cotton sacks or something, but we, we didn't buy it until the Confederate flag is flying over the campus. The, de the dormitories were segregated. Uh, I wrote a paper on black power, which was for my English class. It was a, a term paper. I had a document footnote. I got an F for that, you know. <laughs> you know, so... Uh, Basically, it was the uh, first time I ever got an F in my life, you know, so, so it kind of like turned me off to even be in the school. And I, I would sit at the back of the classroom and pretty much just look out the window and daydream while class was going on because it didn't relate to me at all. And then finally, the students said, we need to do something about this. We got together and maybe out of 300 students there, about 25 of us decided to, to do more than just uh, complain. So we formed an organization called the Student Congress on Racial Equality. And they even had some white students in job, job but it wasn't an all-black organization, but it was majority black and uh, Latino students that got together. And so we had petitions signed, we had demonstrations, and I was suspended from classes and expelled from school for activities. And, uh, but that was like putting Brer Rabbit in the in the brow patch, because where I ended up was in the community of South Dallas, and began to start doing community organizing work in Dallas after leaving Arlington State. We're looking at a picture of the Dallas chapter of SNCC uh, from around, I guess, 67, 68, and that is you on the far right with the beard, looking, looking rather sullen in this picture. Well, look at the woman sitting down in front of me with a fist in the air. That's my mother right there. <laughs> <laughs> and next to her was my wife, Felicia, and I believe that's my sister, Jackie. Is that Anika in your lap? No. Okay. Now, oh, okay. now yeah. Ernie, when you got here, there wasn't a Dallas <laughs> chapter of SNCC. You helped to, you helped to found that. You helped to establish the Dallas chapter of mm -hmm. SNCC, and one of the first things you, you went after was the OK supermarket chain in the city. Tell us about that and what, what the end result okay. was. Well, let me just back up just a little bit to say we formed a chapter there, but after consulting with other students around the state in Houston, San Antonio, Commerce, where there was East Texas State University, North Texas State University had uh, in Denton, Students from all over, we, we held, well, we, in 1967, a, a Texas Youth Conference in South Dallas. And many of those students came from there. We decided to, on a kind of a strategic plan to what we could do in our respective areas and begin to support one another for that. Even at Austin, University of Texas also had students represented there. So we formed a, a Texas Youth Union, so to speak. And out of that came a sense of support statewide for building a chapter of SNCC in Dallas. And one of the first things we did in Dallas was to start just canvassing the neighborhood, finding what people had on their minds. Uh, we began to uh, publish a newspaper called The Black Disciple, which uh, Eddie Harris, who was in that picture on the very extreme left with the glass, was the editor of it. In that paper, we had uh, articles from letters from Vietnam from, from veterans like Ed Harris's brother. Uh, we had articles on uh, international affairs, on on economic rights and things like that. And it came out monthly, I believe, and it, we, it was on like a donation was expected. And we used old mimeograph machines mm -hmm. for that. So we had uh, uh, done education and, and things like that. We decided that we needed to have community mass meetings to find out what the community felt was priority in their mind. So over a period of several, two or three months, we met at two or three different churches in South in Southeast Dallas, and we conducted kind of what we call surveys today, I guess, uh, what's the word they could use for the marketing kind of drive, but we kind of found out from people what was on their mind. And other, 
be even more important to others than police brutality, which is always one of the concerns, or election uh, isolation or election fraud was economic uh, purchasing, and economic power, and feeling the not having a right to jobs, and having second second grade food and stores in our neighborhood. So we, we began to see the linkage between stores that were selling in our neighborhood ungraded food and had unsanitary conditions and would not hire people in the community as being kind of a linchpin. And one of those stores was OK Supermarket. It was a chain of 11 stores. And 10 of those 11 stores were located in the black community. And they created their wealth from those stores. They refused to hire black employees. And they even uh, raised the prices exorbitant. It's kind of like what big fast food chains would charge, not double that price, you know. But since we had no choices for stores pretty much, uh, we limited those kind of high prices. So people identified uh, primary beef. And we decided to, to not only bark out that store, but have an aggressive campaign by going inside first and letting them know how we felt about it. So we decided that we would go inside a store and the one on Pine Street and Oakland, which is now Malcolm X Boulevard. And we would go inside and we would buy, we would take items in the store, put it at the counter, and then walk away without purchasing them. We would go to the meat counter and order them to, them to cut up chicken special ways for us, order certain different uh, cuts of meat. They would package it for us, take it to the front. Oh, we said, oh, we changed our mind, we would leave. Then somebody may have dropped a bottle or squeezed a tomato, and it kind of became a, a <laughs> An avalanche of things happening, but not to the extent where windows were broken or people were hit or damaged, but some eggs got broken, some milk bottles got crushed, some ice cream counters doors were not closed back, you know, so those kind of things happened. And uh, the district attorney's office estimated that more than $200 of damage was done. And at that time, they called malicious destruction of private property over the value of $50 was a felony. So I was charged with a felony of malicious destruction of private property. A few days later, I was taken to, uh, I was called to Justice of the Peace Richburg, I think that's his name, court. He was called a hanging, do you remember him? He, he was called a hanging judge. And so, so I was taken there for an unrelated charge. We had uh, do, passed out leaflets at a good luck, good luck supermarket. And the security guard told us we couldn't distribute literature on these grounds. Said, Man, we can, this is a free country. We can distribute. You can't tell us when we can't hand people literature. You must be crazy. So he said we had threatened his life. And so he took a, a threats against his life charge to the justice of peace. And we were responding to this peace charge. While there, uh, the judge said, wait a minute, I got another case for you too. So he asked us, who are all in this OK supermarket? So almost everybody in the audience stood up. <laughs> but he said, no, I want Mac Millen and Matthew Johnson, y'all the ringleaders. So, he charged us with uh, destruction of private of property, and uh, the state of Texas picked up the charges and formally charged us with it. And I was later tried by all white jury and sentenced to ten years. And the uh, district ten, ten years ten for years. what ultimately amounted to about two hundred dollars worth of damage. But the district attorney, so he was pissed, schools, quote unquote, because he wanted twenty years. The maximum was twenty years. And, and I was told that uh, uh, by jailers in the Dallas County Jail that they had a pine box waiting on me at uh, certain units at the prison system and that it, I wouldn't last too long down there. And I was placed in jail on the $10,000 bond. Also, Matthew, we were the two people charged and convicted with that. Ultimately, though, you became a quote-unquote fugitive from justice for about two and a half years. Tell us how that came about. Okay. Uh, I received many charges I would never ever face court about. There were charges brought against us that were later dismissed. But at the time it would be a fine would have to be paid, a bond would have to be posted, or people would go to jail for two or three days. So this was happening almost daily during the, after the death of King. Uh, it was happening daily. Uh, in fact, one time I was leaving my house, going to my parked car in front of my house, got in front of the car, there was a police car sitting behind me. Said, I, he said, man, I thought you would never get, I got to get off of duty, so here's your speeding ticket for the day. Oh. You know, so that was the kind of thing that would happen. One day we were traveling to my mother's house, and we had five or six police cars following us at all times. We would be stopped 
almost daily, pull up to the curb. Uh, one of my uh, uh, compatriots was arrested for having a matchbox of marijuana in his car that he never owned. And so that carried a two year to life sentence to having a matchbox. And it wasn't anything about paranoia or one that this is true because Leonis Johnson, who was a stick leader in Houston, was given 30 years for having a one stick of marijuana. And, and uh, the gentleman here with the daily paper, Stoney Burns, was given a 10 year sentence for having some seeds in his ashtray in his car. So we knew it was not something we just making up or it, it could come to no consequences. So I was charged with draft evasion. I was charged with possession of a firearm, although I bought it legally at a Target store. Uh, they said I was uh, convicted of a felony, so I couldn't purchase it. But since I was out on appeal, I was not formally convicted or finally convicted, so I had a right to the weapon. So they uh, uh, arrested us daily for things like that. And so being under federal jurisdiction for Selective Service Violation Act and also for firearm violation, I was placed on the federal jurisdiction reporting to the Northern District Court of Texas. And I had my passport taken from me as well as uh, restricted from leaving the Northern District of Texas without permission from the U.S. Attorney. But during this period of seven, eight months, I had made several trips speaking in University of Pennsylvania, uh, New York, other places, but I always had to notify them a few days in advance where I was going, the phone number I could be reached at. When I was returning, they would say, granted, you can go. So my, the last, what turned out to be my last trip was the trip I was to take to the World Council of Churches in uh, Greenwich, Connecticut. And a few days before, we submitted a request, but my court-appointed lawyer told me that we haven't got a re, uh, return answer for them, but don't worry about it. It's going to be like all the, just go on and leave because it's, can't, we get all the information to them. So by the time I had a, arrived to Greenwich, Connecticut, I had received phone calls from the same lawyer saying, oops, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's a warrant out for your arrest. You shouldn't have left. And if you come back by using a major uh, bus or airfare or something, they're going to be waiting for you. There. They're going to arrest you. And so uh, the person who was traveling with me is a gentleman named Quasi, who was also the same gentleman who had uh, been charged with uh, possession of marijuana. We were literally afraid for our lives because of the threats that been made against us, the fact that that whole that same summer, about 30 Black Panthers had been killed from West Coast to East Coast from very suspicious circumstances and outright murders, in my estimation. Uh, so we, we felt, and there was a campaign by the federal government called the COINTEL Pro program, which we can get into more details if you like, that was called by the FBI and CIA to, to destroy the peace movement, the civil rights movement, and the uh, anti-war movement. So this was a thing that was real that was going on. So without planning, without any prior notice, we decided it's best for us not to return to Dallas. So we told the people at Greenwich we're going to go to New York and we're going to find a way to get back home. So we went to New York and we literally disappeared and, uh, for uh, two and a half years. For two and a half years. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. What's extraordinary to me is despite threats against your life, despite threats of incarceration, you never stopped your activism. You continued to be involved in, in civil rights and, and, and speeches and, and it's remarkable that you were able to do that under such pressure knowing that you're, you're in danger, your family's in danger. It's really extraordinary. Well, some of it just comes right to your doorstep. For example, we in, I was in prison at the retrieve unit and it was a Sunday uh, which is supposed to be a non-working day, a day of rest, the Sabbath, keep it holy, and they were telling us that we had to go work that day. And uh, it was Father's Day also that same day, so I was expecting a visit from my family. So I said to myself, not to anybody else, I'm not going to work. I'm going to stay in my cell. And so I found out later that eight or nine other people had decided to make the same decision. So we were all placed in solitary confinement. And I learned later that those other persons had gone for their own individual reasons, some for religious reasons, some for just protest reasons, whatever. And uh, that Monday, we began that afternoon, Monday, when the work crew had gone out again, we began to hear noises, people screaming and shouting, and the noises of sounds like somebody being beat. 
metal being hit against the metal and things like that. So uh, I was put on my shoes and started, I heard, thought I heard cell doors being opened. This is in the solitary confinement wing. And I was next to the last person I heard people being beaten and struck. And so when they opened my door, they said, come out, Macmillan. And there was a lieutenant with a, a bat in his hand, a sergeant next to him with a billy club and rubber hoses. And they said, get to the trailer, get to the, what do they call the work wagon? And so I started walking, and they started visiting, and I started trotting, and they had like a, a line of people striking us all the way through the building to the, to the, uh, the awaiting vehicle for us, which is a little animal cart with a pull by tractor. And uh, I noticed there were eight or nine other people ahead of me. And one, one gentleman was about my age, what I have today. He had almost died of a heart attack. He was yeah. suffering, had fallen out. Another was a Native American who I saw for myself who never ran. They beat him walking. From, he was from the Sioux Nation. He walked all the way without flinching or anything. They just beat him. He was bleeding. And uh, they made us work out there, some of us in shoes, socks, barefoot, without shirts, and for about three hours. And it was well uh, soaked with rain. We had to pull corn and pull the bags through the corn fields. And so it was covered with water. And the, the, so the weight of it, just being soaked with water and the corn, was heavy. And they were screaming at us, told us, cursing us, and calling us all kinds of names, telling us move faster. And they had all the other prisoners on their wagons waiting and watching us. They were, we were being used as a, the model for what happens to those who refuse to obey the law. So it wasn't like I was dared to do this, but it was like just common sense. You're going to stand up for yourself. Right. And that's been the, the course of the events repeatedly. If you have questions for Mr. McMillan, hopefully you picked up a question card when you walked in. If you'd like to uh, jot down a question, we'll collect those right now and uh, go through as many of those as we can in the time we have left. Now, after you, after you got out of prison, you have continued, and, and to the present day, continued to be involved in social activism. The picture we're looking at right now is you at an anti-Klu Klux Klan rally in the early 70s, I believe, or mid-70s. Um, tell us about well, let's talk about Dallas, because here we are in 2013, mm -hmm. the events you're describing are 40 years in the past. How has this community evolved and changed and matured in, in, your, in your mind? Where are we today in terms of race relations and civil rights? We've traveled hundreds of thousands of miles, light years differently, but in terms of the surface, in terms of uh, some of the uh, cosmetics, in terms of some of the arrangements, but fundamentally we still have a situation of the of caste and class and race as being determining factors in where you are in society. And so we have huge and deep pockets of poverty throughout Dallas today, alongside communities of extraordinary wealth, side by side in some instances. And we have homeless people who are being kicked to the curb and uh, treated as assholes rather than human beings. And so we have problems plaguing us. But I do say that we made some great changes from, a, from where I came from in 1957 in those years as a teenager growing up in Texas when you had uh, Tommy Lee Walker, for example, executed in 1957 for murder, rape, and robbery of a white woman when he had alibi witnesses who said he was with them at the time. But he was coerced into a confession. They had uh, officers at the Dallas County Jail beat another prisoner in front of him and say, if you don't tell us what we need to hear, that's going to be next for you. And he was, I think, 20 years old at the time. And so we had that kind of situation in Dallas, along with uh, segregation. The political scene was quite different, too. We had at-large voting at that time. You had to win votes from all parts of the city of Dallas to be able to vote for your neighborhood. So if, if the people in North Dallas didn't like you in South Dallas, then you could not be elected by even your own constituents in South Dallas, because you had to be voted on by everybody. It's called at-large district game. And that only changed, I think, in the 1980s, 1970s, uh, thanks to a class action lawsuit that made where we have single member districts now. So that was a big change that created more uh, involvement, more engagement, and more participation at the city council and even at the county level too. So as a result of that, we've had 
new faces in bright places come to office and make some changes there. Uh, but the uh, employment, economic situation, the, the caste system, the, uh, the treatment by the police on uh, innocent citizens oftentimes re results in injustices of people who've been sent to the electric chair for crimes they commit, you know, uh, but now we do have some redemption going on in that area of innocence projects being taken place. Mm -hmm. So reclaiming uh, some justice in those areas. But the, the struggle continues, the struggle still goes on. It's a worldwide struggle now. I think it was in 1963, 50 years ago, when Kenya and uh, Tanzania became independent. Now all the countries in Africa are basically politically independent, but we see strife and under new circumstances now. We hear about a war on terror today, but there was war, there was terror in 1492 right here, you know what I'm saying? And there's also terror during the 16th, 17th, 18th century right here in this country, not only against the Native American populations, but also against black slaves and uh, indigenous people from Mexico as well. So we've had a continual struggle to fight and the strike, the struggle still continues today. But I do think we're in a better position with young people like little Malcolm over there, who's a, a scholar and a student and a, who traveled on civil rights tour recently and brought back a lot of information for us to, to grow from. So we see the hope and the youth in our faces. And, uh, but at the same time, we have such policies like with the Dallas Independent School Director of, uh, of how they grade and promote and how they so-called educate. It seems to me it's more about training than education, more about standing your place and enlightenment. And so we have the teachers uh, testing for the scores based on the test, not the curriculum. And it's kind of like a, a road mentality being expected of students. And the zero tolerance, you know, is, is almost making kids on a, a pathway from, from school to prison. Mm -hmm. Because if you can get a criminal record for truancy or for uh, speaking back to a teacher, so-called, or for having aspirin in your pocket, things like that, you can get a criminal record build up that pays the way for you for prison. And it's a thing like a, a chain of events, a system at work to promote that from, from the cradle to the prison. I want to take a question from our audience. Okay. Who do you feel was more influential in terms of the civil rights movement, John F. Kennedy or Lyndon Johnson? Okay, uh, let me say something about John F. Kennedy because he died before he could really get anything done. But under his administration, his brother Robert Kennedy was the Attorney General, and John Doerr was the Assistant Attorney General, uh, Deputy Attorney General, I think they call him then, who led the fight for voting rights in the South. So having a presence of the FBI and the Justice Department in the South played an a, a, a interesting role for challenging the voting process that really didn't become lifted until 1965, well after his death. So, but what, I, what problem I have is that the, the federal government was playing uh, a balancing act because to hold office nationally, you have to appease certain parts of the other parts of the country that may not be to your liking. So you cannot you take a daring, courageous person not concerned about their career to send federal troops to Selma, Alabama, when uh, people are being beaten up by a police force down there. But that's what it was called for. So you would often see people from the U.S. Justice Department taking photographs and taking notes while people are getting beaten. So I had a problem with that. Uh, under LBJ, we, we were able to get a war against poverty, and we were able to uh, see the uh, voting rights bill enacted. But it was always with Kennedy and with Johnson, it was a pressure from below that caused them to act. It became in their self-interest to vote and make changes because the climate and public opinion was shifting, and people were in the streets, were active, campaigning and educating themselves, and seeing there had to be another way. So I think it's that pressure, that groundswell from people from the bottom up that made changes at the top. Another question, was your record ever cleared? Um, no, not really. I'm still considered a, a felon. I have a not, I never a, a petitioned for a pardon. 
uh, don't feel it's like necessary to do. Maybe it should be nice to have a piece of paper say your pardon, but no, thank you very much. But no, I still have a, uh, I, I have uh, been free of any crime or any conviction since those days. So I guess 50 years of having a clean record might mean something to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have time for one more question. No, knowing what you know today, if you had the opportunity to do it over, would you still be a civil rights activist? I don't regret uh, my past or uh, anything about my life, even the bumps and the thumps and the losses and the separations. Uh, I wish I had been more of a less, I wish I had been more intelligent to learn and not make the same mistakes again, you know, and be so hard to realize uh, about consequences. Let me just say one thing, or one big step I made that kind of separated myself from the, the movement in a way was in the 1980s, uh, there was a, a tendency for people to make a choice. Either we're going to demonstrate or we're going to build institutions in our community. You can't do the both. We're going to either protest against South Africa, or against police brutality, against whatever, and, but we're not going to do anything in our community as far as building institutions. So it became like a, a choice. Why can't we do both? But it really does require a concentration of effort. So my decision in 1982 was to uh, leave the National Black United Front, uh, which I was the chairman of in Houston, to build a youth organization in Houston in the Fifth Ward community, which was one of the more economically distressed communities, as they call it, and to work there to build institutions that could provide some support, some avenues for young people to, to enlighten themselves, to grow up, to become more productive, more responsible and more caring, more involved, and have young men especially who were without father, positive father images of male role model, to just have someone in their lives who would mentor them, who would uh, help guide them and show them some other alternatives. So begin to do that, uh, not necessarily the political, but I still vote every time I get a chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is all the time we have today. I hope you'll join me in thanking Ernest McMillan for telling his story today as part of our Living History series. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you.